Are you ready to take your real estate investing business to the next level? Next level. Well, you're in the right place. This is the Real Estate Investing Morning Show with your hosts, Wayne and Gabby. Good morning and welcome to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Today is Wednesday, May 15, 2024. The weather today will be a high of 16 degrees in Edmonton, 20 degrees in Calgary, 19 degrees in Vancouver, 20 degrees in Saskatoon, and 20 degrees in Toronto. Oh, Abby. Thanks, Abby. Do you want to say happy birthday to Taylor? It's Tay-Tay's birthday. Happy birthday! <laughs> happy birthday, Taylor. Happy birthday. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to be alive. It is great to be alive. Isn't it? Yeah. Another day our our feet hit the ground. Yeah. It's a good day. Actually, I got out of bed and feet hit the ground and I felt like a pinch in my hip. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see me grab my hip? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, getting old. E easy there. Easy there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, it's good to be here. We're happy to see everybody here. I can see Scott. Scott says, awake. I us look, too. Us too, Scott. Yes, us too. <laughs> Uh, barely though, um, and uh, I, I look forward to Scott's uh, um, Scott's first remarks every morning on the podcast. Um, this is the podcast. This is a place you want to be if you want to get your questions answered for free. This is this is the place to be if you are a new real estate investor, an experienced real estate investor, um, or if you're just looking for a little you know common sense and a little kick in the ass. This is the place to be. Um, that's what we provide every morning. Um, Common sense, mostly. This is common sense real estate investing education. <laughs> um, no okay, fluff, please. no nonsense. Um, did you see the data? Oh, no, I'll be quiet. No. Anyway. Did Did you see uh, the, what the weather was like today? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Okay. Cool. I I just bit my tongue. Did you catch yeah, that? Did you I catch did. me bite my tongue? Yeah. I know you weren't really asking about the weather. Okay. <laughs> it's good to see Rose here as well. Don's here in the show. Uh, Adam, Austin, how's it? Yeah. Um, Samuel, Nat is here. Nat is a guest on the on the show mm -hmm. today. Uh, Nat is real estate investor focused realtor from Calgary. She could be giving us a Calgary market update. Plus some little tricks and and things to look for that can help you save some money on your next deal, especially in a hot market like Calgary. Yeah, pretty exciting. Nobody's really saving money on a deal, you know, in a hot <laughs> market like Calgary. Yeah. Um, would you say that Calgary is the hottest market in Canada, Gabby? It's kind of looking like it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's been on fire for a yeah. few years now. As the other markets cool down, Calgary fired up. Pretty sweet. So... Let me take well, a sip of coffee. Okay. I also, yeah, I mean, like you were saying good morning to people and then you just dropped off, you know, so we it's all... called a segue, Gab. <laughs> it's called a segue. Okay. Good morning to everybody else that Wayne didn't mention. Okay. And say all the names and I'll come back to that. <laughs> I'll come back to that whole introduction to what I was going to say. It's okay. They'll be okay. No, They'll no, 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 no. I don't want to hurt any feelings. Good morning, Austin. Good morning, Adam. I already said hi to Austin. Did you? I don't even know the now names Austin you said anymore. Two. Now it's now it's just, just it's too late. You know kidding. what? It's too late. Hi, Mitch. How you doing? Morning, David. David. Morning, Crispy. Good to see you. Jason. Jason. <laughs> Don't miss Jason. Good morning, Everly. Rose. Karen. Karen's here. Morning, Karen. Morning, Chris. Tyler. Morning, Chris. <laughs> Rock on, Tyler. <laughs> okay. And Nathan. Sorry if we missed anyone. Nathan. Morning, YYC. Okay. So uh, Nat's here. And Nat is an investor-focused realtor in Calgary. No uh, way. Yeah, you betcha. She's going to be a guest on the show today. We're going to talk about little tips and tricks <laughs> and things to look for that can help you save some money on a deal, uh, especially in, in a market like Calgary, because Calgary is a really hot market. It is. Right? Would you say that Calgary is the <laughs> hot market? It's been hot like that for two years. And it's funny. I was talking with someone yesterday. I was telling a story. And I was saying that it was a, a little over two years ago that um, that we took a shot at the Calgary market for fix and flips, mm. right? Mm -hmm. 
coming up on three years ago, actually. I think that we bought it 2022, this time around 2022. Yeah, it was two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago? Yeah. And we were seeing potential mm -hmm. in Calgary, but we were like, eh. like there was only at that time, there was only a small handful of fix and flippers in our community mm -hmm. that were doing stuff in Calgary. And I wanted to replicate our business in, uh, from Edmonton to Calgary, but you know, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And we ran into some, some hiccups and stuff like that. And, and, um, just trying to get people to do what they're supposed to do. You know, that's always yeah. the difficult thing, yeah. um, which can cause delays. And Especially that, a new crew. Working a new, with a new crew. crew. Yeah. And then pushing it into being done, you know, Christmas. Yeah. That, uh, that makes things difficult. And uh, the market took a little shift at that time. I think we listed what, like Boxing Day or yeah, something was, like that? Yeah, it was crazy, yeah. December 15th. It was, it was a terrible time to list. And, um, and of course, like, then it sits on the market for like two months. And we're like, oh, God. We ended up selling it. We ended up, you know, I think we broke even on that one. Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of money there. I can't remember. Um, which is unfortunate because that was supposed to be a big profitable one. Mm -hmm. Um, but those delays, you know, really chewed into it. But I, I, I tell that story because I remember that, like, I remember I'm like, you know what? I think that there's something here for Calgary. I think that the signs were looking very good. I was keeping a close eye on Calgary. And then it, it was like immediately afterwards that spring. I was going to say it was like a month after we sold. I've never regretted selling more <laughs> in my life. Never. Because yeah. it was like I settled on a price. And it was like a month later, everything just goes up. Yeah. And I was so pissed. Mm -hmm. So pissed. I'm like, why couldn't they have just delayed an extra month or two? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Then yeah. we could have gotten all the benefits. But no, we had to sell. But like, it was like the last month right before it went up. Yeah, right before Calgary started. Really started going up. And it's been going up ever since. And it's been fantastic for our other properties that we own there. So that's fine. Um, but I, I, it's, it's funny. I, I was just thinking about that because I, I, I saw it coming. I knew it was going to happen. And before then, I mean, Calgary had been, you know, having a few hot seasons leading up to that. So it was doing okay. It had been going up already, but just not to the extent it's been going up for the last two years. And, uh, and Calgary still worked it calgary was a lot easier at that time because the prices were lower and the rents were lower it was a lot easier to find cash flow and these days you know you really have to do get creative and have like you the value of an investor focused realtor is is so much higher now because you you have to know those little unique opportunities it's not as easy as it what it used to be you know what i mean mm -hmm. It's not like you can just be like, oh, I'm just going to go buy this house. There's going to be no, there's, there's no multiple offers and it'll, it'll cash flow. It's not, it's not that simple anymore. Yeah. But the trade-off was ridiculous amounts of appreciation. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk a little bit, a little bit about that before we bring in Nat this morning, because that is what I love about real estate investing. Sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't love appreciation. I know, and this is probably going to shock a bunch of you guys. I personally don't like appreciation. I've loved Edmonton for the last 10 years. Loved it. Loved it. And we've been in a market that hasn't appreciated at all. Yeah. And I loved Calgary before as well. Calgary, you know, leading up to 2020 was like the same as Edmonton, just maybe 30 or $40,000 more. Yeah. Just slightly. I, I might be a little off because some people are like, no, it's not. I know I might be a little bit off because Calgary's a completely different market than Edmonton. But, um, the, the cash flow and the the ratio or the, the 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 difference between you know the expenses and the purchase prices were very similar. The ratios were very similar, 
And back when 2017, 2018, you could look at Calgary and Edmonton and you could see pros and cons to both, but they were both very similar, right? Edmonton's always been a little bit easier because it's always been a little bit cheaper Mm -hmm. and the cost to enter has always been a little bit easier. But they've always been very close. And now that Calgary is blown up, it's like it's a little bit more difficult. And me personally, I, as much as I love the appreciation, like appreciation is nice and stuff, but you know, I've the reason why I went so heavy on Edmonton for the last 10 years is because I could say I want to buy a property and I could go buy a property. Yeah. And I didn't have any competition. And I could find cash flow very easily. But now, just in the last few months, that's going away. Yeah. And actually, I, w- I want to I pass this off to the, to the audience as well. And I want to hear what you think as well, Gabby. Do you want appreciation? Do you want the values of your properties to go up? Or do you want it to stay? Would you rather it stay in a cash flowing position with no competition. I'd like to hear what the audience says, because I almost feel like I'm setting everybody up to say what I want to say. I, maybe I should have, maybe I should have prefaced this a little bit better, but I'm curious to think, hear what you guys want to think or what you guys want, because, and I'm going to take a little break and, and I'm going to come back and see what you guys say, because my experience over the last 10 years, what I want isn't what everybody else wants. Everybody else has told me I want to invest in hot markets. When I was investing at Edmonton, everybody was like, mm, I'm going to put my money in, in, in Ontario because it's just, it's a, it's, it's a much better place to make faster cash. Right. And I haven't really had anyone on my team for the last, you know, for the last 10 years. And I'm curious to think, I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Do you prefer appreciation? Would you rather a really hot market that's going up in value or would you rather a slow market? No competition with cash flowing properties. I'm going to take a quick little break. I'm going to see what you guys say when we get back here, and I'll get back into this. Sound good? Sounds good. Ready to open the door to financial success with smart real estate investments? At Calvin Realty, they understand the power of smart investments. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, their team is there to guide you every step of the way. Picture this. Great locations, cash flow, and a portfolio tailored to your financial goals. Calvin Realty specializes in identifying great opportunities, turning your investment goals into reality. Say goodbye to guessing whether your next step is the right one. Smart moves, smart investments, Calvin Realty. And we are back seeing a mixture Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sam, it depends. <laughs> um, Fritz says appreciation is a bonus, cherry on top. Cash flow and mortgage pay down is the main course. Uh, Scott says both. Um, let's see here. Oh, and then Scott says cash flow. Um, YYC investor says appreciation. Rentals are for long term growth. Hot markets allow you to get out sooner plus it's easier to find investors austin says i'd take cash flow first rose says both as well Mm. um i personally you said you'd want to hear what i thought too yeah (laughs) um i personally would always invest for cash flow if there was always that option in my market available to me i think like i'm somebody who doesn't want high risk I, I hate high risk. I hate the stress of it. I want a nice, easy portfolio that has cash flow coming in, building up my reserve. And for my partners, it's just nice and easy. We make the money that we expect each year. The cash flow comes in. It's, it's fantastic. That's how I want to invest. However, once you build your portfolio and you're sitting on your portfolio, of course, it's nice to see the prices rise. Yeah. Of course, it's nice to eventually see appreciation on it. But our rental portfolio, we're not trying to get out of it sooner. We're not trying to 
to get out of these properties. These are long-term wealth. These are building generational wealth for us. This is something that down the road when we're, you know, ready to retire, when our kids go into university or like whatever it is, that we have these properties building wealth for us that we can access when we need to. Mm -hmm. So appreciation to me, a hot market where there's tons of appreciation being made instantly is for people who need cash now. And that was never, that was never our plan and what we were looking for. We were always looking for the slow, steady building long generational wealth. Yeah. So I think that where the it depends comes in here is what are you looking for? Are you looking to make quick cash for something? Or are you looking to build a future? It's a good point. If I was if I was looking if I was looking to get quick cash now so that I could build my future, then maybe in the interim I would invest in a hot market to try to make this a quick This is not buck. the answer that I was looking for, Gabby. It's a, it's an appreciation of cash flow. <laughs> you cannot do it in depends. You have then to Then I an would answer, take my money out. You, okay. And I would invest it in a in a steady market. All great points, but not the topic that I'm talking about today. All okay. great points, but not the topic I'm talking about today. Because the reason why I bring this up is because I don't want this appreciation. Yeah. I don't want it. Because now that there's appreciation, now everybody who chases appreciation is chasing my market. Now, if I want to buy a property today, I can't buy a property today. Yeah. Because I either it's have freaking to freaking hard. Because it's hard. I have competition. And... I'm going to have to write multiple offers. I'm going to have to pay over asking. Whereas I was telling people when interest rates were low, really low, and there was no competition, I was telling everybody, buy now, buy now, buy now. Why? Like The interest rates are the lowest they've ever been. Buy. Oh, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the I, I'll, I can. What I can... happens if the interest rates go up? Just the every some people can just find the negative in in in, in all the most beautiful things, um, and they just wouldn't buy. And then the second the market starts going up, they're like, "Oh, I should probably buy." I'm like, "Oh, I can't. There's just too much competition." Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I loved the reason why I loved Edmonton was because for ten years it didn't go up at all, and I had zero competition. I could buy a property whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. Right. Now I can't buy a property. So the question is, would you rather buy a property <clears throat> and in a year have it go up $50,000 in value? Or would you rather buy a property and in a year be able to buy three more properties? This is, this is it. Because I, I bought a bunch of properties last year and it was great. But, and those properties have gone up 10, 15%. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's a great return on my investment. I would rather buy three more of those though, because over a period of 10 years, I can make a lot more money on three more than I would on one appreciating 10 or 15%. Right. And I liked your, your thought about, yes, when when you hold the properties, it's a great it's great news. And mm -hmm. I've said it for many years that I swear to God, whenever Edmonton does go up in value, you can find you can find me quoting it in multiple different places. I've said when real estate finally does the values finally do go up in Edmonton, <laughs> I'm gonna do really well, and I'm not gonna fuck up like everybody else did last time. I'm gonna do really well in a hot market. But I also did really well at a down market. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because when you look at properties, my, my opinion on properties is that they are not like stocks. You don't want them to go up and down in value. I look at properties like a business, a little business. And I want to buy a little business on a good little plot of land that has potential to go up in value, of course. But ultimately, I want that thing to operate like a Tim Hortons. Mm -hmm. I want it to have good reserves. I want it to have good cash flow. And I want people constantly coming in and out and in and out and in and out. And just constantly making money. Because that little business is making money while the value of the land is going up. 
And I'm okay if the value of land sits the way that it is for a long period of time, as long as my business on that piece of land is doing well. And as long as the piece of land isn't going down in value. So you need a stable market with lots of people coming and going, right? You need good clients, you need good demand. But I look at the rental properties as, as, as a business, right? And I buy my business in an area that has good landlord and tenant laws, that has low taxes, right? It's profitable. Now that the value of the land is going up or the value of the assets are going up, it's like, okay, well, I guess I won't be buying anything for the next little while. That's kind of where I'm at right now. And you can still, if you haven't bought anything, don't be like, oh, Wayne says don't buy anything. What I'm saying is I'm not buying anything because I'm in a different position than you, right? Yeah. I think that it's always a good time to buy, in my opinion. You'll never lose. If you, if you, play, if you play the game right, you will never lose. Go ahead and try and argue with me on this one. I will kick your ass. There's never a bad time to buy. As long as you buy a good business on that piece of land, you can ride out anything. Yes, you may buy high. Yes, it may go down next year. But as long as you buy that business and it operates well and it can still make money on its own, you can ride it out until it goes up in value again. Mm -hmm. But if you're buying negative cash flowing properties, if you're buying businesses, rental property businesses that don't operate well, you won't be able to weather that storm. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to wait until it goes down again. I like to buy when nobody wants to buy. That's the best time to buy. I like to buy when I have zero competition because the opportunities are so much higher. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, like this year, I have to I have to double check on our portfolio, but I believe our portfolio has gone up over a million dollars this year. So we've done pretty well. I believe our portfolio has gone up by over a million. I haven't I haven't calculated it because like I have to check on everything, but more or less at least a million. And I believe within the next year after that, I think it'll go up another million or two. Because values are going up. Don't get me wrong, that's great. Adding a million, two million, three million. But if I can't buy any more properties, that kind of fucking sucks. Yeah. It means I can't do anything more. I just have to sit on this and watch it grow. Mm, fuck that. I want to buy more. <laughs> I want to expand, right? Yeah. But as the as the market grows and you know, as the the opportunities change. It means that you need to adapt as a real estate investor and focus on different things in different cycles. And different cycles have different opportunities, which is why it's so important to keep making sure that you're listening to this podcast every day throughout the year and throughout time. Because what I say six months ago, what I say two years ago is not going to apply today. Why am I not flipping in Calgary? Well, two reasons. One, the team thing didn't work out. Um, And two... It's competitive. When I bought it, there was no competition. Um, Sometimes I make the dumb idea of holding a bunch of meetups and teaching people how to do it. And then I teach people how to become my competition, which is a bit of a curse for Gabby and I, is that we're so giving and so um, willing to help other people that we end up creating competition. I have a... Side note, between us, I'm fairly certain that Gabby and I played a big part in Edmonton growing. I mean, the immigration like is, is probably the biggest factor. I'm not gonna say that I'm <laughs> that I'm that I move mountains and, and and real estate markets. I'm not saying that. But I do understand the influence that we have, and I do understand that by us saying all these things is probably contributing to it. Mm-hmm. Um so I've I've created competition, but Just like the Calgary market, you know, if, 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 if it gets saturated and lots of people are after it, then you just focus on other things, right? And right now, Gabby and I are just watching the curve right now, seeing what's ahead, what's coming, what's the new opportunities. We'll jump into that. We'll try that out for a few months or as long as we can, as long as we can milk it, right? Because, uh, you know, you can't just, I can't say that I'll, I'll try something out and it'll be good for a year. It'll be good for as long as it's good, yeah. right? 
And I'm not telling people to to shift strategies constantly. What I'm saying is, is pay attention to the market and what opportunities are available. Don't get romantic about a certain opportunity because things change and you don't want to you don't want to go all in and put all your eggs in, a, in the basket and then find out that it's not going to work anymore, right? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, flipping in Calgary can still definitely work, but the fact that I'm not there makes it very difficult. And for me, again, for me and where I'm at in my stage, it makes, I would rather allocate my time and my funds into things that are just a little bit easier. But I think for newer investors, I think there's, there's huge opportunities for flipping in Calgary. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. It is crazy what I see people doing out there Yeah. for the locals. Some cool stuff. But uh, me personally, um, if I had to choose, I would rather Edmonton stayed the same values for the next 10 years and I would have made a shit ton more money yeah. than the extra million I made this year in, in equity. On that note, though, which I think we'll probably talk about tomorrow or the day after, is we're uh, we're planning on refinancing some properties. Mm-hmm. I'm one of which is in the process. Uh, we're looking at another one, and I got my eyes set on another one as well. Um, I'm just doing a cash flow analysis right now, and I'm also watching the market closely, trying to, f- to time it properly. Um, when you want to do a refinance and pull out some equity, whether that be to you know reallocate into different investments or to pay your joint venture partners back. Uh, you got to be strategic to make sure that uh, um, you do it at the right time. Ideally, you want to you want to find some sole comparables that are that are beneficial for you. Um, also, you know, I don't want to do it right now and then find out the value goes up another hundred thousand dollars in six months. So I want to make sure I get the most out of it. I might be able to get an extra eighty thousand dollars. Is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you need to take into consideration, you know, is that going to cash flow afterwards? Right. You don't want to put your, we have a great cash flowing property that can weather storms that's ironclad. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then you go and you refinance it. And now suddenly you lose all that cash flow. Now it's a high risk property, but I was able to buy a second property. Yeah. You need to do that cash flow no, analysis on, on the subject property and then the, sorry, on the existing property and then on the subject property as well to make sure it works. So we're in the process of doing that right now. We can talk about that a little later this week, but lots going on in Alberta, I tell you. Yeah. Great op- new opportunities. Mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have talked about this stuff a year ago because the, the opportunity wasn't there. But now the opportunity is here and it creates new opportunities. Yeah. And uh, it's exciting stuff. I like big changes like this. Um, sorry, I don't like it. It's fun. It's fun to try it out. I'd prefer to go back to what it was like. Mm-hmm. I like I like my boring. But it's fun to, to try new things out that, you know, we... I haven't seen in Edmonton. So, um, strap in. Get a hold of all these uh, new opportunities. Uh, build out a business plan. And uh, we're going to take a little break here. And we're going to get Nat in. And we're going to hear about what's going on in Calgary. What kind of opportunities you can take advantage of right now with with, with where the market is at. And as well, not going to lie to you. Calgary's a hot market and you're going to need to come equipped with tools and tricks to make sure that you're getting the best price and also getting the deal. So now it's going to give us some ticks, a trip. It's going to give us ticks, <laughs> tips and tricks. And some things to look for uh, when you're looking at properties to help you save some money. Okay. Sound good. Let's do it. We'll be right back and then we'll get Nat in here. It's time to sell your house or buy a new one or an additional one. But where do you start? Do you drive around neighborhoods hoping to spot for sale signs? Do you take a shot in the dark with a real estate listing website? Or do you go with an experienced and focused realtor? Nazarene Legere is the licensed expert realtor you've been hoping you would find. Working in Calgary and surrounding areas, whether you're buying, selling, or investing, Nazarene will help you bridge the gap between you and your real estate goals. Find Nazarene Legere online at houseandhomeyyc.net. Are you just starting to build your real estate portfolio? At Kirkwood & Brennan, we are real estate investors and mortgage brokers who understand real estate investing. Not only do we help you get a mortgage, but we help you build a better real estate portfolio. Check us out at kbmortgages.ca or call 778-847-0552. Take the time now so you have more time later. Well, 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 investors, you're looking for some lucrative off-market opportunities, but all the good deals seem to have dried up on the MLS. 
simple what do you do? You go to Legere Home Buyers, a Calgary premium wholesaling company. That's what you do. Whether you're looking for the next fix and flip, buy and hold, burr project, or redevelopment, you'll find the best off market deals with Legere Home Buyers. And don't worry, Legere does the work for you. Join the buyers list on calgaryoffmarket.ca and edmontonoffmarket.ca today. And we're back. We're going to bring Nat into the room. Wayne's working on it right now. <laughs> good morning, Nat. Good, good morning. Is that, <laughs> was that hold music? <laughs> Wait, uh, waiting room music? I don't know. <laughs> How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> I've been super busy, like super busy. I've been to showings every day since the 1st of May, guys. Every day. Wow. That's awesome. Getting anything accepted it, out there? Uh, no, I'm working with retail. I have, a, so I've been doing a couple of open houses. And so I picked up some retail buyers. Nice. It's not going so well, guys. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, it's not a good time to be any type of buyer. Like, the market is wild and sellers are interesting. <laughs> let's just say that. Um, so, yeah. So, let's go right into the market update. Let's do it. Can't wait. Okay. Okay, so we're going to do a little um, time travel. We're going to go back to January, okay? okay? Okay. Let's go back to January of 2024. And the overall price was 572300 okay? That's where the market was sitting. Um, a price of a detached home was 702 Okay. Right now, today. In Calgary, we are sitting at 603700 So went from five residential. Mm -hmm. Five, what was it? Five? 572. 572 up to, what was it? 603. Six, wow. Six, That's a huge uh, jump. Yeah. Um, just because you were talking about like how quickly things shift. And the detached market was 702 back in January. We are now sitting at 749 for Holy. a detached home. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so we're talking less than five months. Yeah. January, February, That's... March, April. Yep. Yeah, four months. <laughs> four months. Absolutely bonkers. We went from months of supply of 1.3 months to 0 0.94 months of months of supply. Mm. Okay, so you guys still don't uh, have much on the much on the MLS then? Nope. So our inventory is still only sitting around 2,700. Crazy. And so do you think that's just because as they go on, they're being snatched up? It's yeah. just moving as quickly as they're coming? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've also lost... Uh, a couple of buyers because they were just like, this is crazy um, going out. And when you're a retail buyer, you're at a certain limit, right? Like the bank will only approve you for so much. So you never want to hit a buyer ceiling and literally sellers are some sellers um, are listing, you know, appropriately, but it's going into multiples. I'm talking to like 50, $60,000 over ask for just like, homes that should not be selling for that. That's... Um, and then, yeah, and then we're seeing them, well, I've been seeing because I like to keep watch. I've seen a few of them that we've put offers on that we lost out on bids, them come back to market a few times. Um, so yeah, just <laughs> that's been wild too. And I'm like, see, if they would have went with me, I was a sure bet. Oh, okay. Like so they're getting them locked mm -hmm. up and then not able to close on them. And then it's going back on the market. Yeah. Yeah. Basically okay. is what we're seeing now. Yeah. Is that they're going back on market. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I know. So also across Calgary, cause 
if you guys been tuning into the show, you know that Calgary is broken into quadrants across Calgary. It has jumped everywhere from 20 to 30 to $40,000 across the board. So you are lucky to snatch something up at 450. I mean, lucky, <laughs> like really lucky. <laughs> so what type of like, what type of give paint a picture of what type of property and what type of area we might, might, might be able to find at that price. Like, what would we be picking up if we were able to, like, find that hidden? Paint it? Like, there'd probably be a lot of red and black. Like, black, (laughs) red spots. So, you you might be lucky, again, in the east, because it's still only sitting around 441. And I'm talking, you're picking up maybe a condo or a townhouse. Um. If you're looking for a semi-detached, maybe a semi-detached, but even those are now going for four nine nine, and I'm talking about in rough neighborhoods, like really rough neighborhoods. Wow. Um, but if you can get something, if you somehow like you know you you have a great realtor who will go door knocking for you, and you can get something for under that, and you just do, I don't even want to call it a lipstick flip, uh, maybe like a chapstick flip. Where you're just like painting it. (laughs) You're just painting it and maybe you change some hardware like the handles or the light fixtures. And then you're putting it back on market and you'll probably get over five. Well over five. Oh my God. For like a semi. Yeah, it's insane. Why did I stop in Calgary? Why did Um, I stop? You, it left a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, you never know though. Like it's, you can't, you can't predict this. Mm -hmm. And even when you think it's like, oh wow, it's, it's really good. It could stop at any time. Like it could stop today. Um, but it's, I, man, it's, it's been going for quite some time. It seems, I don't even want to ask you the question. Cause I think it's unfair mm-hmm. to ask, but when will it peak? Um, I'm just I don't asking think that the it'll... world. I'm just asking the world. Yeah. Here. I don't think that it will necessarily peak. Like, I don't think that Calgary has gone like Ontario and BC have where it just kind of skyrocketed. I feel like Calgary's just been like this slowly trugging up the hill. Like just chugga chugga. It's, it hasn't like took right off. Mm -hmm. Um, and because of that, we're having still having so many people move here and that's the thing, right? I think that's why we're not really peaking is because we still have this steady stream of people moving here. I guess if that stops, then, then we might peak. Yeah. And I think that Calgary is still affordable in the eyes of Vancouver people and Ontario people who continue to Mm -hmm. migrate to Alberta. And so in comparison to Edmonton, they're getting really close to the mountains. They're still getting kind of some of that lifestyle that they're used to. So Mm -hmm. if they're looking to move to a little bit more affordable market, I mean, like in Vancouver, you're hard pressed to find anything under a million. And so if you're taking that money out and you're, you're moving to somewhere more affordable, then Calgary is still attractive to them, right? So you're still getting mm-hmm. that that migration inter, inter, um, from from Canada. So yeah, it's interesting though. It's just like, I mean, for, for most people, we think, how is that affordable? How could people af- afford that, right? Mm-hmm. But it is because we're going into multiples. Like there's not one deal that I've had that we weren't in multiples. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then um, for like the investor side of it, um, all I can say is that you have to be ready to pull the trigger. So I've had a couple of deals that I've presented to people. And by the time they were like, yeah, let's go, it was too late. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Um, So basically, I feel like if you're an investor and you're looking for a deal in this market, you have to be ready to let's go and then figure it out after. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> um so when you say ready 
Yeah. So when you say ready to pull the trigger, you're saying like, don't even, don't even sleep on it. Don't even wait until this evening to talk to your spouse. Like you need to be ready to go. Basically. Yeah. Like if I'm bringing it to you, it's because I feel like you're going to make it work. Like it's going to work for you. Like it's what you're looking for. So just, I know that's me trying to tell people to put a lot of faith in me, but I'm like, listen, right now in this market, this is is what you're looking for. Like Mm -hmm. you need to lock this up. And then we'll figure the rest out after. <laughs> I, um, so, and I don't think you should apologize for that. Um, because that's why people have you, yeah, right? Yeah. And you're, you're, you're not that's their true. financial advisor. You don't have any like right. fiduciary responsibilities. But at the same time, it's like, that's why you get an investor-focused realtor on your team. So that someone can guide you through that and 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 tell you hey this is what's going on in the market you don't understand this like i do if you do not act if you want this if you want this you need mm-hmm. to act now otherwise you will not get it it's not telling someone this is good or this is bad it's saying if you want it you have to do it now otherwise right. you won't get it right. and i like think if that you have to run back and keep running numbers it's gonna you're gonna lose you're gonna lose out yeah and we talk about that on the show like every goddamn morning. You gotta know your numbers. You have to know what mm-hmm. types of properties you buy in your market. You gotta know it inside and out. I can recite mm-hmm. everything about my market and the properties that I buy. I don't have to think about it. Someone can say a purchase mm-hmm. price and the rents to me really quickly, and I could tell them whether it works. I don't need to look any further than that. And that's what level you need to get to. And if you want to get deals like this with Nat. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you're not, then Nat's gonna say it. She's going to be like, hey, like if you don't do this right now, you don't figure your shit out in the next 30 minutes, you're not going to get it. And I think that you sh- investors should value that yeah. for what it yeah. is because that's what you pay for. And I think it also mm-hmm. is just shows how important it is to, I mean, you just said it, but also like knowing what neighborhoods are your go or no go. Like mm-hmm. be and being crystal clear with your, with Nat about, um, you know, like I will not buy in these neighborhoods. I'm not interested in holding properties in these neighborhoods, but all of these ones I will consider. And, and then having your own breakdown of like, at what price point is it go or no go? And if you know those numbers and if you know those neighborhoods, it makes it so easy to say yes, when one comes across in the neighborhood at that within that price point that you said, right? And so just knowing those goes or no goes and having those limits on those specific neighborhoods and types of properties will make it so easy when that brings you a deal to say, write it up Mm -hmm. without having to go and run the numbers. You've already ran them. You know what those people are called? What? Trigger pullers. Yeah. Trigger pullers know what the hell they want. Yeah. Absolutely. Be a trigger puller. But even in like the Calgary market right now, I feel like the landscape is changing. Like even neighborhoods that were like a lot of no go for people, what I'm seeing happening is like a lot of investors are going in, they're renovating these properties, selling them to people who are migrating here, who don't know about the neighborhood. And it's literally changing the whole landscape of it. (laughs) And it's pushing the people who used to live there to look elsewhere for rentals, like outside of Calgary. So maybe like Chestermere or Airdrie, like they're being pushed to mm-hmm. go elsewhere and to move. So now they're, they're not even, yeah, it's not even so much as no go anymore because there's people willing to buy them from outside of Calgary. Oh, geez. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there's not much we can do about the market. I mean, you know, the market no. is the market. And like you mm-hmm. said, one of the biggest things is, is the fact that it's, it's just mostly immigration. And as long as we have a housing shortage, um, and until we start building more housing units, we're going to continue to have this problem for probably another eight years from now, um, at least six. So, and even that, I don't think we're going to have it solved by then. <laughs> so just for the, at least the next six years, you know, this is just going to be what our market's going to be like. Now, right. for investors, you still want to try and make some money on the buy. So you kind of have to get a little creative now. And, you know, we had a discussion about this and, and, and you got a, you got a, you got a few ideas and some tips and tricks, uh, up your sleeve for, for investors who are still trying to look for a deal. who are still trying to make a little bit of money on the buy. Um, why do you, why don't you dive into to that, uh, 
this morning? Yeah. So usually I feel like a lot of investors are really hesitant when certain things pop up, especially on like an inspection report or even when they're just doing their walkthrough, whether it be like cracks in the foundation or depending on the age of the home, if there's like asbestos. Um, so I feel like there are certain times when like they can be serious and there's certain times when it's not, but either way, when you're a buyer, you can use it to your advantage. Um, and I've been on both sides of this. So I've been a seller when somebody tried to come in and be like, this sewer line is the worst sewer line I've ever seen. And it was a thousand dollar fix. Right. But they tried to get the money off. It's just that I have a reliable team of mentors <laughs> mm -hmm. who I can call on and ask questions. Um, so I was able to mitigate that and be like, no, actually, it's a quick fix. Same with foundation cracks where they were like, we want $30,000 off. And it was, again, a $1,500 fix. Um, and then when it came to mold, it was a $10,000 fix when I was told it would be like a $50,000 fix. Um, so again, relying on those people around you, but also being like, okay, when you're selling, like it's actually not that serious. But if you run in, if you're a buyer and you run into this situation and maybe the investors, um, the seller is not as educated, that's a time where you can really push to get money off and be mm. like, this could you know, this could turn out badly. Um, but you've already done your homework. Uh, when I went to just regular realtors that I know, and I asked them about the situation, they were like, oh, you should just give them the money off. It was the first thing they said. And I was like, mm, I don't know. So then I went to like actual mentors and investors who have seen these types of things. And they were the ones who were like, yeah, no, that's going to be like this much. You're like, you're good. It's not that big of a deal. Um, so when you come across these things as an investor, as a buyer, um, don't shy away from them and be like, oh, this home is no good. Especially yeah. if it's like mold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Unless um, that house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless that house is falling over. Anything can be fixed. And even when it is falling over, there's ways to fix it. Um, but there's, there's a certain, there's a certain go or no go as far as like foundation stuff goes, but otherwise right. if it's just cracks, asbestos, mold, um, whatever, fill in the blank, everything, mm. everything can be fixed and everything has right. a cost that, you know, it would cost to get fixed. And I think mm -hmm. that people overestimate what the actual cost is going to be. It, if you, if you're an asbestos expert or what do you call it, like an abatement expert, um, mm -hmm. you know exactly what that number is. So being an expert in a field or having dealt with something before, you're going to be able to look at that and be like, oh, no, I just need to call Jim and Jim can get in here and get that done for 800 bucks. Whereas, you know, most people look at this and they're like, oh, like you said, oh, the house is, is completely uninhabitable. It's it, this is never <laughs> going to work. Oh my gosh, I don't have time for this. No, I don't. I would no, let's just find one that's 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 ready to go. And you'll hear that from home buyers and you'll hear that from investors. Like I'm just no, I don't no, this house is no good. There's a reason there must be a reason why there's asbestos in here. What's what's the reason there's asbestos in here? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because they put it in there in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> <'Cause that's what laughs> they used. But it, you know, it's it's like, oh, this is this what if if there's asbestos in here, then what else are they not telling us about behind the walls? And so the more, like you said, right. the more you understand, you can put a price on it and be like, okay, cool. It's going to cost me a hundred bucks. Then I want five grand off for my time and for my, my energy that I have to put into this. And then you get a really good deal, right? And you get a, you know, mm -hmm. 40, 200 bucks off and, uh, and, 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 and you just became a, a smart investor. Right. Um, I just recently went into a house and it was, it wasn't falling over, but it was almost to that point. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was on a good street. It was in a good neighborhood. It was really bad. The yard, the backyard was a mess, but you could have fit a double garage back there. Um, the furnace was open and there was a flame on, like you could see the flame in the furnace. Somebody must have came in and flicked the switch to turn the furnace on. Um, and, but the house was bad. You could smell it. They must've had a dog or a rabbit or something in one of the rooms, but the ARV of this price 
was like almost 800,000, but they were only asking for 30, I think it was. 430? Um, 430, yeah. Wow. It ended up going, I think it ended up selling for 540 or 550. Wow. But still a really good spread. Um, but my person was like, no, we're not going to do that, which was fair. I'm like, that's fine. It's a, it's a big undertaking. I was like, but just know that this is, this is like a really good, it was like $250,000 um, from the, what somebody bought it for to like what they could have sold it for at the end. Mm -hmm. But they were just like, no way. And I'm like, and a lot of this is just like cosmetic and ripping up the carpet and stuff. But they're like, nope. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Or, uh, it's, 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 it, that's fantastic. Um, that's, and this is all really good information. So, um, the three that you mentioned were, uh, mostly asbestos mold and foundation stuff. Is there other mm -hmm. things that you can think of that, uh, that might yeah, also. Yeah. So like sewer scope, um, I know that, uh, people try to get a lot off, um, or they don't do a sewer scope. Like when the big trees are in the back, um, especially in older mature neighborhoods, it could be like crushing the, the pipes. Yeah. Um, so it could lead to like blockages, backups, um, or to, a, one that people don't think of is like, how does your backyard slope? Um, like, is the rain coming towards your house? Is it graded properly? Um, could that rain be pooling on the foundation to make cracks? Um, mm -hmm. And just like by looking at that, you can go in to the seller and be like, hey, did you realize that this is happening? Like, do you have any water damage? Whatever. And if they're like, oh, there could be then basically you can go in and be like we want this much money off because we don't know what it's going to look like when we open that wall up right um so that there's times to be like really aggressive when looking at certain things nat i gotta be honest with you this is a very touchy mm -hmm. subject for me <laughs> oh, water water yeah. this is this is actually this is pulling up a lot of yeah i'm getting a Trauma. little P, I'm sorry. little pst a ptsd here <laughs> mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Because these these are things that oh god if you've been around long enough you start to you know experience these things and my god mm -hmm. um, and selling properties my like on the selling side I uh, selling properties is the worst thing ever and in fact this this is this it almost makes me not want to sell any of my properties because just I know that buyers are going to do this and when a buyer says they're doing a sewer scope I just like. Uh, because you know they're going to find the smallest little root that's coming through in your sewer line. And they're going to be like, oh, there's roots in the sewer line. It all needs to be torn out. Which is oh. totally mm -hmm. normal. Oh, or. Is, so, yeah. so all you do when you're selling is in the public, not the public, but in the private realtor remarks, you put, we get this augured, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Being sold as is. <laughs> and there's nothing anybody can do because they know that it's non-negotiable so when i sold the one in forest lawn the garage was literally it was a double garage but it was falling apart there was mold it was literally ready to fall down and all i put was garage is non-negotiable selling as is either you want it or you don't right and most people nobody came back and said anything about the garage to me because they yeah. knew it was something that we wouldn't negotiate on yeah. Interesting. I was so gonna... being proactive and letting them know, mm -hmm. hey, don't don't bring it up because we're not going to talk about it. Yeah, for sure. And I think that it's definitely um, a be like a way better time to be a seller these days than it was back when we were selling properties because, um, oh yeah, people just want it and they'll go in unconditional and over asking and and yep. with very little negotiation, right? So I mm -hmm. think it's probably much easier in twenty twenty four to be selling any type of property. <laughs> Yeah, but a lot of them are doing that, especially on older homes that do have things wrong with them. They're going in over ask and they're going and then they're trying to tear it apart, like really bring the right. money down. Like that's what a lot of people don't realize is that some investors will go in with whatever the seller wants, but they put it, an inspection on there. And then in the inspection, if you have a really good inspection company, they will tear them apart. Right. And then they're like getting it for well under what they put the offer in for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously you deal with a lot of this back and forth nonsense on the buyer and on the seller side. Um, yeah. And we, we talked recently about how uh, you, especially in a hot market like this, you're probably encountering a lot of real estate professionals, realtors um, who are not so professional and not so Ugh. experienced. 
And uh, how, what's it like dealing with that? And, and also from the investor perspective, what's it like dealing with that when, um, when the seller's realtor just doesn't know what the heck they're talking about in situations like this, whether it be related to mold or asbestos or foundation or anything? Mm -hmm. So honestly, I just, I try to be as professional as possible. And then I just try to educate them on what it is that, that we're talking about. And then I also, so most of the people, um, so once I talk to my mentors, I then contact professionals because I'm not a mold expert. I don't remediate asbestos. I don't fix foundations. So when I call on these professionals, I ask them, is it okay if I give your information to this realtor? So not only do I come with, okay, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. This is how this could go. And this is who I spoke to about it. Here's their number. Um, that kind of stops them from being like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I've been in it for 20, 30 years. I've been a realtor. So a lot of them will pull, try to pull rank. And I'm like, mm. yeah, but this person is a professional and this is outside of your scope. <laughs> so yeah. um, you being a realtor for 30 years really doesn't have anything to do, but some are just like, they don't even want to hear it. And that's fine. So I just let my investor or buyer or even my seller know, like they don't want to listen to what we have to say. Um, so this might be something that we might just have to walk away from. Mm. And most people understand that. And um, there's been a few deals that I've had to walk away from because the other end realtor just was non-cooperative. One time I had to bring my brokerage in. That was a new learning experience for any investor. If the other realtor is uncooperative, you can bypass them and go right to the brokerage. Um, get your brokerage to deal with their brokerage. Interesting. That's good, yeah. That's that's a great tip. I mean, obviously, uh, investors aren't going to have to deal with this, but it's maybe if they're dealing, you know, if they're working with another realtor, just advising your realtor to be like, hey, just to let you know if they're being difficult, then let's just, is there any way we can just reach out to the the sellers or, or, or the, the buyers, you know, um, uh, realtors brokerage, uh, so that way we can talk to them directly um, if they're being difficult to deal with. Um, right. That's, that's, it's. It's something you never really think about is that, you know, a deal killer might be the other party's representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it might be and some of them. So when you sign an agreement like a, a buyer's or seller's representation agreement, remember that agreement is between you and the brokerage. Um, and then the realtor is just the representative of the brokerage. So, oh, okay. yeah, so that's actually how it works. So when a realtor is being uncooperative or un doesn't communicate with you, then you can just bypass them. And right now, a lot of realtors, so our contract and our fiduciary duties is we're supposed to present every offer as a seller agent that comes our way, regardless of if it's insulting or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's not insulting at all. They just some seller realtors try different things, different techniques, different tricks, like coming in low to try to go for multiples, but sometimes that backfires. And that was the situation with me. He, the low, the, he listed really low and we came in about $10,000 lower and then he wouldn't communicate with me <laughs> at all. He just stopped and we put in three offers and so then I obviously had to go over his head because my buyer really wanted the house and that's my job, right? Mm -hmm. He's trying to get my buyer the house. Um, but it didn't work out that way. We ended up walking away from it. Um, and, but, uh, so he, that realtor might have a complaint coming his way from my buyer as well. So, yeah, so things can go <laughs> south really quickly if the realtor doesn't want to try to make a deal work, basically. Mm-hmm. And, and so, like you said, the realtor is responsible to show all offers and mm -hmm. I've, I've had it happen where it's like, yeah, um, the realtor will come back and I, they try and use like little tricky one lines where like, I'm just going to let you know, they're never going to go for it. Um, mm -hmm. and just saying things like that to almost deter you, to make you do the, make the decision not to do it. You know what I mean? Or like, yeah. I don't know, we're not going to, you know. They don't want to hear anything that's less than this. And as opposed to them saying flat out outright on some sort of documentation that I will not present this to my, um, to my, to my seller. So, um, 
and I and I get it. I mean, I get it from the the seller's realtor's position. It's like by especially you've probably been in this position, like you don't want to give your clients a low ball offer out of the gate because the, the, your, your sellers, your clients confidence is, is going to drop dramatically when they get something like that, because it's, it's such an emotional place to be. Even me as experienced mm-hmm. as I am, that is the most emotionally. Charged. It, it, ch- what's that? Yeah. Emotionally charged, emotionally charged like mm-hmm. position to be in. Like it's cause you don't know. Do people like my house? Do they not like my house? Like, it's, I feel like I'm in high school all over again. It's like, I don't know if I'm worth it. Is is this price right? Am, is it going to sell? It's been three days and no one's called me back. And then you get a low ball offer and you're like, oh no, God, this is terrible. We're going to lose so much money. Like it's, it's a weird spot to be in. But and if, if someone gets a low ball offer, that can really affect their confidence. Not necessarily, Wayne. If you, if you speak to your client and let them know, that people are wild, that somebody might offer you low, but you like, what are your options? Like you can always counter. Like I just had somebody counter on me. I was like, you know, this is what we can do. And they're like, yeah, send in the offer. And the seller countered. And I was like, that's way too high for us. So we're going to have to pass. But Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't matter what somebody offers you, you can put down and counter with whatever you want as a seller. Right. Right. So you don't have to take any offense. Just be like, okay, that's not acceptable, but here's what we will accept. And then you just cross out an initial and then send it back to them and be like, after you meet these terms, well, it's already signed. You just have to initial. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of sellers don't do that. They, They just take offense immediately. And I feel like that's kind of lacking on like other people's parts because they're not setting those expectations. Like, you know, don't take any offense. Don't, you don't have to get emotional. Like if this isn't an offer you want, let's counter. The worst they can say is no. And then we're still where we've been, which is without an offer. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here, Nat. Um, I know that you have kids to get off to school. We have a kid to get mm-hmm. off to school, so we won't keep you too long here. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank if, you so um, much for having me. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you for bringing all those stats and those awesome tips for the for the audience here. And if anybody in Calgary or who's investing in Calgary would like to get a hold of you, how can they do that? Um, right now, the best way to get a hold of me is my number. So 587-926-1619 is the quickest way to get a hold of me. If you need comps, you can send me an email and then send me a text that you sent me an email and who you are, and I can pull those for you as well. That's awesome. Can you say your number again slowly? 587-926-1619. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks again, Nat. It's been a pleasure having you and we'll see you again in a month on the show. All right. See you next month. (laughs) Okay. And everybody else have a wonderful Wednesday. Happy hump day. And we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Investing Morning Show. Looking for more guidance and coaching? The REI Master's Mentorship Program might be what you're looking for. For more information, email info at reimasters.ca.